The 20th of January, 1941. Franklin D. Roosevelt is sworn in in Washington as the first U.S. president to take office for a third presidential term. During the election campaign, Roosevelt promised the nation that America's sons would not go to war. But, after being re-elected, he changes his political course. For unexplainable reasons, says the president this day in his speech, tyranny and slavery are about to surge over man's future like a tidal wave. But America and democracy will not withdraw. Few Americans share his view. Some even believe to have found their idol in Adolf Hitler. The members of the German-American Bund meet in the forests of New Jersey each year. The camp is called Camp Bergwald. German-Americans have built a community center here. Their activities are an embarrassment to the German government that fears offending the American public. At Santa Monica Beach, the composer Friedrich Hogander filmed scenes together with director Ernest Lubitsch. The two men from Berlin are among those who have become successful in Hollywood. Star director Lubitsch always uses his connections to find jobs for immigrants from Nazi Germany. Friedrich Hollander, who gained world fame as the composer of Marlena Dietrich songs, has a villa at Woodrow Wilson Drive in Hollywood Hills. Daughter Feline was on one of the last passenger ships to leave Europe before the war. A carefree mood prevails. Friedrich Hollander writes of their times in his memoirs. It is strange to imagine there's actually a war going on far away. It registers clearly enough on the seismograph, but people are learning to live with the daily disturbances. U.S. President Roosevelt still cannot go to war, but America helps the British in any way. Scenes from the Canadian province of Nova Scotia. In Halifax, harbor cargo ships are loaded with weapons and supplies. U.S. warships protect the convoys against attacks by German submarines. More than one million Canadians fight on the battlefields of the Second World War. German submarines manage to successfully torpedo many cargo ships. Navy jargon calls it war tonnage. The Royal Navy fights back. Scenes of survivors from the sunken battleship Bismarck arriving in Halifax. On April 6, 1941, the German army invades Yugoslavia and conquers the country in 11 days. Gottfried Kessel 
a combat correspondent with the Berlin Guards Regiment Gross Deutschland, films Serbian army prisoners in Ponchevo, near Belgrade. Members of Ponchevo's Swabian German colony watch the procession of the vanquished. The town also witnesses the memorial service for nine members of the ethnic German militia who were believed to have been murdered by the retreating Serbian army. The local German community attends the ceremony en masse. After two German soldiers are killed in an ambush, the Berlin guards search an adjacent cemetery. They capture armed Serbian civilians discovered hiding in the crypts and catacombs. A German military court condemns them for possession of firearms and as partisans. On April 22nd, a local ethnic German, Hermann Brum, publicly hangs 20 in Ponchevo. German officers preferred appointing civilians to serve as hangmen. Prussian military tradition regarded the duty unworthy of German soldiers. Then, ten former Serbian soldiers, also found with weapons, are shot at the cemetery wall. Exactly two months later, on the 22nd of June, 1941, the German army invades the Soviet Union. Friedrich Gierke takes part in Operation Barbarossa as a supply officer of the 23rd Infantry Division. He brought a camera and color film from occupied Paris. In the evening of the first day, his unit reaches the burning village of Andrejevo. In less than one week, German troops sweep across eastern Poland, annexed by the Soviets in 1939. The Red Army was obviously not prepared for the attack. Soviet army staffs were never trained to execute strategic withdrawals. On the 29th of June, after fierce battles, units of the Central Army Group conquer the Ukrainian town of Chiakano. Harold von Wiefinghoff Reich documents these scenes for his home movies. Ukrainian women wait at the entrance to the temporary prison camp. They hope that their men will soon be released. 1,200 Soviet soldiers are detained here. Hitler considers the Russian campaign also an ideological war and orders that political functionaries of the Red Army be immediately executed. But most units ignore the Fuhrer's order, which is in violation of international convention. Hitler will rescind the order within a year. Among the Ukrainian population, the conquerors are welcomed as liberators from Stalin's yoke. Field Marshal Walter von Reichenau with his staff in the Ukraine. On the 27th of August 1941, Adolf Hitler meets the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini in Gorsk. The Duce has committed Italian forces to the campaigns, though simultaneously fighting the British in North Africa. Lunch 
with the generals. The color shots were taken by Hans Bauer. He has been Hitler's chief pilot since 1933. Because of this, he is free to pursue his hobby in the immediate vicinity of the Fuhrer. On the flight to the Ukraine, Mussolini sits in the cockpit. The pilot uses the opportunity to take a close-up shot of the Duce. The Duce was sitting there, stiff like a stuffed dummy, as Hans Bauer later recalls. In Uman, Hitler and Mussolini visit the troops. Escorted by Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Führer Secretary Martin Bormann, Field Marshal Ronstedt, and General Yeldon. The soldiers welcome their supreme commander with acclaim as Hitler's armies are still victorious. The successful advance lasts until mid-October. Scenes from a burning village near Smolensk filmed by Friedrich Gerke. In 1941, three and a half million Red Army soldiers are taken prisoners of war by the Germans. Many of them will die of hunger and epidemics. The ones who survive are transported to Germany to do forced labor. Later, they will be offered the opportunity to serve as auxiliary troops. In the winter, the German advance is slowed by mud, then paralyzed by cold. At the outskirts of Moscow, the German army is brought to a halt. A sports group of the German labor front from Breslau exercising in May of 1942. In the Catholic Borstel St. Josef's Kare, near Kunzelsaal, 40 city children whose parents were deported to concentration camps are quartered. Here, they fraternize with German children. Race researcher Eva Justin films material for her thesis on the fate of gypsy children not brought up according to Germanic standards. She recommends having them sterilized. In 1942, a professional camera team travels to Warsaw to make a film about the ghetto. The reporters were probably sent by the propaganda ministry, but their precise task remains unclear. After the war, fragments of these films were discovered in black and white. It was only three years ago that in a Moscow private collection, a previously unknown reel with cover material was discovered. SS Police General Albert Police Commandant at Lotz labels the Jews primary carriers of typhus and meningitis, justifying their confinement to protect the non-Jewish population. An entire battalion of German police guard the four entrances to the ghetto. 
entrance and egress is strictly controlled. 400,000 people live in the ghetto, packed together in a small area. Each month, many die of hunger or typhus. Propaganda film producers take a special interest in the neglected and starving children in the ghetto. The children sing the ghetto song when begging, good people, have mercy on us and throw us a piece of bread. But the adults themselves have little to give. In the summer of 1942, war reporter Hans Bastenay shot this footage in Russia. The German army has initiated another major offensive. This unusual scene was recorded through the view slit of a tank. The newsreels of the propaganda ministry only include scenes of advancing troops, heroic deeds, and defeated Red Army soldiers, but Bastinet and his colleagues nonetheless had orders to record every aspect of combat. On the 10th of January, 1943, Hitler receives the Romanian dictator Ion Antonescu in the Führer's headquarters, Wolfschanza. Hitler felt the collapse of the Romanian front contributed to the critical situation of the surrounded 6th Army at Stalingrad. He nevertheless orders news of his allies' failure censored from the press. The fact that the 6th Army has been trapped near Stalingrad for weeks is concealed from the German population on the instructions of the Führer. A group portrait with the Prime Minister. On the 14th of January, Winston Churchill arrives with a delegation in Casablanca for a secret conference with the American President. The British want to continue their advance in North Africa and prepare an invasion of Italy. Roosevelt's advisers warn him that Churchill only wants to protect English interests in the Near Orient. The Allies negotiate for 10 days. Then, Roosevelt without previously consulting Churchill, announces at a press conference that only the unconditional surrender of the Axis will be accepted. Two months earlier, more than 100,000 Allied soldiers landed in North Africa, occupying Morocco and Algeria. The US president reviews four nations of the American forces. An army cameraman films the scene for the archives. After their defeat at El Alamein, Rommel's Africa Corps has withdrawn to Tunisia. The field marshal himself returns to Germany on sick leave. U.S. General Eisenhower's remark that Rommel left Africa to save his hide angers German troops. Arab volunteers are recruited for sabotage acts behind enemy lines. Colonel Meyer Ricks from the Intelligence Department Foreign Armies West films with an 8mm camera the swearing in of the auxiliary troops. Code name of the action, Felmy. The Tunisian people are not accustomed to the discipline of the German military. The future fate of this Arab sabotage unit is known. Most probably it never became operative. In 
May 1943, the poorly supplied German army in Tunisia surrenders. Scenes of the advancing US troops. Individual skirmishes and air raids are documented for American audiences by a unit of former Hollywood cameramen. In the end, 130,000 German and 120,000 Italian soldiers surrender. In the port of Tunis, German soldiers embark on the Thomas Stone. The American transport ship participated in the landing in North Africa. Now it is to transport the defeated enemies to the USA. Until the end of the war, they will languish in POW camps. On the 8th of June, 1943, at El Aoina, near Tunis, American cameramen filmed German aircraft destroyed by the Germans before surrendering. Directly adjacent, a German military cemetery. At the conference of Casablanca, British and Americans agree to postpone the landing on the French Channel coast. First, Sicily is to be conquered to secure the traffic lines through the Mediterranean Sea. The 10th of July is the day for the landing. The 1st Infantry Division has been allocated a section in the Gulf of Gila. Due to their division's insignia, the elite troops are called the Big Red One. Cameraman of the Offices of Strategic Services, the OSS, document the landing. Graphic impression of the first phase. Italians have long since tired of the war and prefer to terminate the fatal coalition with Germany. Two weeks after the start of the Allied offensive, Benito Mussolini is dismissed by the fascist Great Council in Rome. However, the Germans offer fierce resistance. The fights will last for 38 days before Sicily comes under Allied control. Nazi leaders hoped to turn the tide through the development of so-called miracle weapons. At the secret Pinamunde proving grounds, a new prototype of V2 rockets are being tested. 
they will enable the Germans to strike against British cities once more. But the test results are not satisfactory. On the 29th of June, Heinrich Himmler visits Pinamunde. The Reich's SS Nieder has been interested in the V2 for some time. Now he wants to see it demonstrated. The prototype takes off according to plan, but after a few seconds, it goes out of control. Werner von Braun considers the whole project endangered and requests another try. This time, all goes well. English and American bombers raid German cities almost daily. Yet this is not without danger. The route over the Alps is a long flight, and the German artillery positions are by and large intact. Yet most of the flying fortresses unload their lethal cargo undisturbed. Scenes of a raid on Wilhelmshofen. On the night of 27 to 28 July 1943, bombers of the British Royal Air Force opened a 10-day offensive against Hamburg. Firefighter Hans Brunswick films crews fighting the fires. The bombs started a firestorm, transforming entire neighborhoods into rubble. Over 40,000 civilians were killed in these so-called Gamora raids on Hamburg. Yet the Allies fail in their real objective. They cannot break the German population's will to hold out. Early in February 1944, bombs are loaded in Hensville, Lincolnshire. Each of the Lancaster bombers can transport a dozen 500-pound bombs, plus a 4,000-pound heavy explosive bomb, which the pilots nickname Cookie. Tonight, the target is Berlin. The 550th Squadron of the 1st Bomber Command is given final instructions on the flight route and target area. Now German cities are bombarded around the clock. The Americans fly their raids during the day, the English always at night. British bombers take off at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and after some four hours, they are over the capital of the Reich. Do you want a total war? asked Joseph Goebbels of the citizens of Berlin exactly one year ago. This is what they get.
in one of these raids, the Ufa studios in Berlin Tempelhof are heavily damaged in February of 1944. A cameraman documents the damage. The production of feature films and newsreels from Gerbil's film empire is hardly interrupted by the raid. The film producers are working on a new newsreel series. Panorama is to be its title. The programs are filmed in color. Youth as Helper on Farm and Field is the title of one of the first sequences. These scenes are typical of most of the programs. Panorama, intended for export throughout Europe, emphasized German life and culture. During the shooting in Berlin, war reporter Jaworski records the influence of the war in his shots. Soldiers on leave and happy Berliners relax in the picture. The fact that Berlin, in the fifth year of war, is frequently raided by the Allies, the Russian front is beleaguered, and that hundreds of thousands of German soldiers are dead or imprisoned, does not stifle social and recreational life. Scenes of successful dive bomber raids against Soviet targets suggest the German military's unbroken striking power. Yet the fortunes of war can no longer be reversed. As Allied air raids threaten to paralyze the German armament industry, strategic production plants are moved underground or encased in bunkers. In 1944, a huge steel and concrete plant for constructing submarines is built near Bremen. Navy construction official Steig documents the construction with his camera. concentration camp prisoners help with construction. But despite the work of thousands, the bunker Valentin remains uncompleted. No submarines will ever be constructed here. The 6th of June, 1944. At dawn, Allied landing forces storm the Normandy beaches. Despite heavy losses, they create a ridgehead on the continent during the first day of the invasion. Cameramen of Hollywood celebrity John Ford are on duty during D-Day, utilized by the American Secret Service OSS.
Ford's Hollywood colleagues, William Wyler and John Sturgis, with their camera team, are on duty for a special film project of the Air Force in the south of France. Since U.S. troops have landed near Toulon in mid-August, they escort them north. Operators are welcomed by the French rural population with bread and wine. A German soldier surrenders to the GIs. For him, the war is over. He has survived. Nearly on, a German army bus was hit by a shell. Americans faced resistance by snipers, German rear guards, and French collaborators. The American cameraman writes this about these shots. French victims of German atrocities are excavated by members of the Red Cross. The advance from the south of France encounters a poorly coordinated defense, netting many prisoners. They are first billeted in temporary camps and are later, like their comrades of the Africa Corps, shipped into the USA. After Italy has concluded a special armistice with the Allies early in September 1943, Rome was occupied by Germans. Now the Americans march into the Eternal City and are welcomed as liberators. The Germans withdrew to spare Rome the fate of a defended city. Some in Rome call for the death of the Duce, who still heads a puppet government in northern Italy. An audience with Pope Pius XII, Pontifex Maximus. for peace as expressed in scenes of a dance in Gateshead in the north of England. It appears that along with war materiel and troops, the Americans have imported their boogie-woogie dance style to the British Isles. In October of 1944, the Allied troops reached the western frontier of the Third Reich, the so-called West Wall. A GI records with his camera the first impressions of the enemy country and its population. Scenes from Aachen, the first German city the Americans captured after a tenacious defense.
Six months of war are still ahead for the Allied soldiers, with fierce battles, many dead, and the realization that most of the Germans will obey their Führer to the end. A panorama sequence features the Hitler Youth, which provide replacements for the German Navy, shot in the autumn of 1944. Shortly before the end of the war, 16-year-olds will be drafted for military service. Young Germans are accustomed to air raids and food shortages, and adapt well to the rigors and privations of military life. A circus program emphasizes continuing cultural life in the face of imminent defeat. Master Ullmann with his 12 Arab stallions and Dolinda the balancing charm are seen in the cinemas of the Third Reich. Early in April 1945, units of the 3rd U.S. Army liberate the concentration camp Ordruf in Thuringia. Some 10,000 inmates were confined in Camp S3. Only few survived the harsh privations. The Americans are shocked by the indescribable conditions in the camp. It is the first concentration camp they see. The inhabitants of the surrounding villages are forced to tour the camp. At the same time, the German army is in position along the Oder River opposite the Russians. Near the cellulose manufacturing plant of Niederwutzen, the 5th Combat Group of the 9th Army has a skirmish with Soviet reconnaissance troops. The capital of the Reich is only 40 miles away. A war reporter of the German army films the operation. Cameraman Gerhard Germs records German assault guns. Scenes of local German counterattacks were always popular in the newsreels. Heavy artillery of the German army in action, advancing German soldiers, slain enemy troops. Propaganda features of the Third Reich continue until the end, up to the last meter of the last color film roll. <laughs>